Hello and welcome to Tools in the Shed, a podcast powered by Cars Guide, ready to rip into car stuff that has caught our eye this week. I'm Cars Guide Deputy Editor James, and with me is Senior Editor Matt. G'day. And, and after returning from three months in the wilderness, Editor Mal. Welcome back, Mal. Hello, gentlemen. It's great to be back. Mr. Now, this week, this week, we're bringing out the heavy artillery and looking at the much anticipated Great Wall Cannon dual cab ute due here before the end of the year. Uh, we'll run our eye over some recent entrance to the Cars Guide garage and Mal's expanding fleet. And we'll check in with a man asking the simple question, what is love in this week's must watch? So stay with us. But first, some feedback from last week. And last week, we were talking about Byron's story on half price heroes. You know, here are the new cars you might want. Um, here are some half price examples, um, alternatives in the used market. And we got some good feedback. Uh, our old mate Lofty Visions says, another great show, guys. Uh, thank you. Thumbs up. So thank you, Lofty. Um, he says the WZ Fiesta ST is a great secondhand Ooh. bargain. Yep. He's, he's seen a few 2015 to 16 models for around 15K, yep. which is great bang for buck if that's your thing. And they've been so, 15 for a while too. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah. There's, yeah. Been a, there's been a few lower than that. I'm, <laughs> I am an eager uh, observer in that part of the market. Um, I never buy, but I always look. And um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, there's been a few around 11 or 12 grand. Um, and, you know, with, with respectable Ks and in decent condition as well, although yep. there was one I saw a little while ago that was 9,500, but it had been stacked. So <laughs> just be okay. careful if you are looking in, in the performance hatch market and right. make sure you uh, check for prior damage that may have been covered up. And cool. plenty now, of them would have seen track time too. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Lofty's son has noticed the license plates on many cars that we and other Aussie sites review... <laughs> have the rego starting BGL. And he says, what's all that about? Are they private plates? He'd no. be stoked if you could let him know. Cheers, thumbs up. And I, no. I, rack, I rack my brains on this. I know that there are various uh, companies that use um, dummy plates to represent a typical Australian licence plate, but it, it's not a real rego. Yep. And I went to look at those sequences. I couldn't find BGL anywhere. I... Has, has that struck you guys? I think BGL is just whatever the New South Wales uh, black and white plate uh, system is up to at mm. the point in time that he's mm. seen these cars. You really? might have just might have just been that there was a, a, a bunch of cars that came through for Rego at the same time. Yeah, okay. and anything we review is brand new, and they only keep them on fleet for you know a brief period of time. So they, it kind of always represents a you know a snapshot of yes. right now. Yeah. So, but I hadn't noticed that. I'll keep my eyes peeled. Well, we'll keep, we'll, we'll, we'll keep a watch on BGL Gate and see whether or not we can discern an ongoing trend. Yeah. Um, the mind boggles all BGLs. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Bertie, um, our old mate, uh, proud Victorian, says, what's a reasonable odometer reading for a five to 10-year-old secondhand car? Now, he remembers the days when Honest John dealers would advertise a car with low kilometres, meaning under 100,000. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, what do we reckon for a five to ten year old car? What's what's good or what's reasonable or what's a bit over the top? I've got lots of passionate thoughts on this topic, <laughs> and uh, I think passionate I think it depends thoughts? on the car. I think it depends largely on the car. So, you know, a small engine that revs a lot uh, is working a lot harder than a big engine that you know, big say a big diesel engine that delivers yes. its power at two and a half thousand revs and doesn't it, rev much at all and barely ticking over yeah yeah you know, it doesn't work very hard but it you know it comes down to how they're, they're engineered and designed as well um so it varies considerably depending on the type of car but yep. um you know i think we, we operate on an average uh fifteen thousand k's a year that i one? was i was going to say uh, i was going to say 20 board. but but yeah i think it's well let's call it between 15 and twenty thousand k's yeah yep. and look generally if you if you fall under that multiplied by the the age of the vehicle it's low yep. and you know the other side high, but yeah, it uh, it's it's unwise to look at it in that black and white. Um, yeah, through that black and white lens. Yes, yes, that's, that's true. Sense. That is that is true. Now, um, Nathan Smith, Nathan says uh, we always <laughs> emphasise the number of kilometres a car travels. So to your point, Mel, um, a low K <laughs> car commands a better price. Does that apply to electric cars when battery life is perhaps compromised over time? But, but not by kilometres travelled. Um, and he says, 
as an afterthought, by the way, I enjoy your podcast. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you, Nathan. Um, I was going to say, I think he's right, but again, it would be how the vehicle's been used. If it's a full zero emission, zero tailpipe emission car, it's the charging cycles that the batteries had, yeah. and the number of them, and maybe the type of them, that if it's very high-powered recharging, there's a certain amount of heat involved that may put some stress on the battery and, and send it south sooner than, than if you were charging it a different way. I suppose it's new territory in a lot of ways. Yeah, very much so. And the other thing is, um, like, the kilometres travelled will still have some bearing, <laughs> there's a pun, because <laughs> the car still, you know, whilst an electric vehicle has far fewer moving parts, it's still got plenty of moving parts and yeah. Yeah. stressed yeah. moving parts, bearings, brakes, bushes, you know... Um, I think, yeah. that's, I think that's components. one of the great myths of electric cars is that they don't require maintenance. They do, yeah. you know. Yeah, there's still do. plenty oh, yeah. of bits that need replacing and, and care, care for, you know. And, yeah. and highly complex cooling systems as well. Yeah. You know, we, you know yes. look, we're all annoyed by the need to replace a radiator or when a radiator fails. Like, mm. these, yeah. the batteries are so temperature sensitive yeah. that these cars are full of fans and full of coolant lines and full of yes. radiators and... Yes, I remember bearing, bearing, thermostats. Bearing, bearing I think it was um, Jalopnik yeah. that ran a story um, from a, an owner of a Tesla that had reached a million miles, and they'd kept a catalogue of every single cost that they've encountered over that time. And it really did dispel the myth that this is a maintenance-free sort of uh, drive experience. You've got to keep in mind, if you are looking at an electric car, even a used one, that it will have things that go wrong. It's not going to be perfect. No car is perfect. So just remember that, I think, is the important part. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Good point. Now, and, you know, brakes and tyres too, you know. Yeah. Yes, of course. They're a, they're a constant. Grudlin 74 just makes the, the bold statement, secondhand cars are very environmentally friendly. And I, I think that's um, a really good debate topic. That would be a fantastic debate because on the one hand, You've got all of this carbon stabilised in this car and its construction happened a long time ago. It meant that new cars may not have been produced, but then you've got a possible smoky tailpipe. You've got the emissions that it's actually putting out there. How do you balance that statement, you know, that secondhand cars are, in fact, environmentally friendly? Mm. There are indeed environmental benefits to not wasting all that work that goes into building a car by holding onto it longer. But, yeah, as you say, it's balanced with... Uh, how much an older car emits and how uh, a car that's wearing out emits. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah, ad advances in technology um, sort of dispel that a little bit as well because, you know, as we watch the average fuel consumption figures drop and drop and drop and drop, um, and as electrification becomes more and more mainstream, we're going to see more of the uh, new models using less and less fuel and emitting less uh, CO2. But that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a less impact on the environment from those things because you do have to mine for the battery components, for example. Yes. So there's there's the whole well-to-wheel uh, argument that you need to consider when you're making a statement like older cars are better than newer cars for the environment. Yeah, that's mm. true. That's true. I mean, it is just you could go on and on and on, couldn't you? I mean, Lithium is typically extracted from fairly delicate environmental areas and it's a limited resource. So battery technology will move on and probably leave lithium behind. But yeah, other heavy metals and things that are currently used in batteries, it's all quite problematic. Yeah. Um, so let, let, let's, you know, let's leave it there. It's, it's not an easy one to, to answer <laughs> um, in would, the context of a podcast. Yeah, I would also like to acknowledge though that until, was it 2018? You know, historically we have been at an advantage environmentally in that we produced vehicles here we produced the glass for them you know back in the day they produced the plastic etc as well uh, you know the wheels etc you know yep. that is no longer the case unfortunately but yeah, yeah. Um, yep yep it's now, complicated um, uh, scenario another regular hammer rocks um is noted that new car depreciation in australia is his word shocking um he had a uh, cpa uncle uh, always practical who a long time ago advised him to save dollars and buy a 102 year old model with low k's and let someone else take the uh, depreciation hit but he thinks it's got to be even worse in the uk because he watches segments like uh our top gear where they have the challenge segments to go and buy a, a banger or a cheaper car or whatever um fifth gear alternative used cars 
And he's amazed at what they can buy you <coughs> for the money um, compared to Australia. The, the, and he's, he's right. But the first mm-hmm. thought that occurred to me that overall new cars are cheaper in the UK uh, more often than not um, than mm-hmm. in Australia. So you've actually got a lower starting point um, from which they depreciate. But, yeah, it's a smorgasbord, seemingly, um, in the UK for used cars. Yeah, I've been um, trawling the uh, Audi TT used car sites over there uh, and a bunch of other um, cars that I I like to keep an eye on. Um, And, you know, even the parts that you can find uh, are relatively um, considerably less. Um, But also, yeah, I think that this is... It's 100% right. The, The cost of entry in that market is lower because... You know, that's just how it is. The the pound is different to the Australian dollar. We have to consider yep. that. Yep. Um, and so, you know, you might be paying, say, 9,000 or 10,000 pounds for a brand new Fiesta, um, whereas, you know, if, if there was a Ford equivalent in Australia, you might be paying $20,000 sure. for it. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think, but I do think Australian um, used car resale values at the moment are much stronger than they have been in the years gone by. Okay. There's a lot of people... Um, buying used cars right now because they've got the opportunity to dip into their super and buy a car. If they don't want to be catching public transport, they'll be doing that to mm-hmm. you know yep. get around the whole COVID situation. So I think that there's, um, for instance, in in four wheel drive land, the a lot of people are buying four wheel drives like uh, patrols and and Land Cruisers and Hiluxes and that sort of thing. And I've got a a, a friend and colleague of ours, um, one of our video uh, guys, Glenn who went in and found out that, you know, he might have paid $49,000 for his, his Hilux SR5 a couple of, well, it was probably seven or eight months ago. Today, to replace that car is sixty two grand. So, wow. yes. you know, there's, yes. a, there's a premium being paid both on used and new. Yeah. Mm. Well, the, and the, the, the go, sorry, sorry, I was just going to say, the, the recent warranty extension, so the status quo for mainstream brands has gone from three to five years, and there's plenty of others that go beyond five years. That, in time... <clears throat> will also theoretically encourage better resale across the yeah, board. True. Um, uh, but I also, sorry, James, I just, yeah, sure. um, the other thing we can't ignore is that uh, for the UK and the US is that they've got the Northern Hemisphere winters mm-hmm. with the salted roads and it really just destroys cars. Mm-hmm. You know, Good they're point. still full of steel control arms that no matter how much rust protection you put on them, if you douse them in salt, you know, every day, they yeah. rust. And that's, that's why doesn't happen so, many, so many Americans value a California <coughs> car, meaning high, yeah. in, uh, probably high in the Sierras, you know, but but dry and, and no humidity and all that stuff. But the other thing I was going to say is you probably have to be cognizant, too, of like for like between here and the UK in terms of specification. So, you know, um, they might have lower grade models that don't ever see the light of day here yeah. um, that, that are going to be um, less in the, or a more attractive price. Yeah, um, in the, the, the Mercedes E-classes with hubcaps. <laughs> oh, yes, like taxi Still. spec, yeah, yeah. Rubber, rubber mats and all that, yes, exactly. All right, well, we'll, we'll leave that button, but we'll carry on to PHEVs, FEBs, um, and we did touch on plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, and our old friend de Cook said um, he was theorising on how to get FEBs off the ground in Australia, and what it boiled down to was lift fringe benefits tax for companies providing charging for staff, great idea, mm-hmm. incentives for businesses to install charging stations, and, of course, the, the elephant in the room, incentive for buyers, you know, to, to actually encourage them to get a car. You then have commuter transport that barely costs anything to run, although we've shot a few holes in that um, in the last five minutes or so. Um, FBT on EV charging at work halved in Germany, because as we know, de Kolk was recently um, living in Germany. And yeah. Bertie, Bertie chipped in and said there does need to be an EV strategy involving all tiers of government, so federal, state, local, Charging points, subsidies, reduced FBT rates for EVs, but he's not holding out too much hope. The feds can't even ditch the LCT, which protects a non-existent car, uh, local car industry. Yeah. So he's right. The, the, the cogs grind uh, pretty slowly, I think, on these things. Big time. Mm. Uh, we were discussing this yesterday, Matt, weren't we? We were. Yeah. yeah. Um, this... And just the added benefit of a plug-in hybrid over a regular car uh, Mal, you made a really good point that, you know, not being a dad, I've never really thought of. And it's the refueling situation, like going to a petrol station or, um, you know, like not having to leave your kids in the car or get the kids out, take them into the shop, get them oh, back yeah. in, all that gear. You know, that the to be able to just plug in when you get home, um, yep. 
is yep. is just a such a brilliant outcome. And then yep. if you're charging from the solar panels on your roof, never having to pay for yeah. it as yeah. well. You pay for the car. Yeah. Precisely. Now, um, um, Blake, Blake Swan charged in and said, um, you know, we were talking about plug-in hybrid owners forgetting to plug in, um, that, that it possibly becomes too arduous and they just drive the car on the, on the internal combustion engine. And we said collectively that that's just the equivalent of a petrol counterpart. But of course, he makes the, the valid point that you are hauling around everything that goes with um, the car being a hybrid. So battery, electric motor, all of that extra weight. So it is not the equivalent. Um, he's quite right. So, um, you know, makes sense if you drive within a very limited EV only range on a daily basis if you remember to charge. So um, that's the key point, that you do have to be diligent in terms of charging the car up to, to yeah. get the benefit. And I think all of us in the motoring industry have been thinking the same thing, is that when you, there's a drive-in, you know, inductive charging pad that you can just park on top of, that's going to change everything. Um, yeah. Because you don't have to think about it. You know, yeah. it's one less yeah. thing. We all have busy lives. I hate that. I hate that. But that's the truth. Uh, I and, just hate, I hate thinking. I don't know. Yeah. It's such a waste of time. I don't want to. Don't I've want noticed to that. Thinking. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, can I also say, think of it in the context of electric door, electric garage doors. Who, who, you know, no one wants to get out and manually open a garage door. And it's, yeah. it's the same effort required to plug in an electric car. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Really, no one's going to want to do it. Not a bad analogy, actually. Yes. Now we'll move on to more general feedback. And Reg Fundies has said he loves the po uh, loves the podcast. Thank you. Um, Skoda Kamek question for Richard, who obviously is not with us today, but had been talking about Skoda Kamek last time he was on the podcast. So Reg says, tech pack or driver support pack, worth it? Or do you just go the next grade up? So I actually, Reg, went to Richard. He came back with his thoughts. And first of all, he said, why can't you ask me something easy like what the meaning of life is? So, <laughs> you know, he's, he's, he's faced a challenge here, but he says the tech pack costs $3,800. You get things like a big 9.2 inch, you know, media screen, better sound system, wireless Apple CarPlay, LED headlights, blah, blah, blah. Driver support pack, $4,100. Auto parking, heated seats, power driver's seat, leather upholstery, you know, and other safety bits like blind spot warning and rear cross traffic alert, blah, blah, blah. He says what you should do is get the driver support pack because the safety equipment trumps convenience features every time in his book. So that, that's his point of view. So no point stepping up a grade either. You'll be spending 6K to go into a Monte Carlo, which is the next level up, and it has next to none of the features in those yeah. packs. So he says 85 TFSI with the driver support pack is the way to go. So there is a comprehensive response for you, Reg. I hope that helps. It helps uh, me, and I wasn't even interested. <laughs> Now, Reg also chipped in and said, if we want a second-hand bargain, he has a couple in the back paddock. He's got, oh. an, eight, he's got an 86 Telstar and a 00 Falcon, which means, of course, it's an AU Falcon, oh. um, both running. How could you go wrong? Oh. So, uh, you know, he's in the market if people, uh, are people are up there. And I would remind people of the brilliant Facebook page called AU Falcons Doing Incredible Things, yes. um, which is a constant source of wonder and amusement, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. <laughs> um, now, let's see if came at us with a couple of comments. Um, he says, Mitsubishi's 10-year warranty, quote, sounds like a plan. Um, so he's obviously impressed by what Mitsubishi has done. Mm -hmm. But I think we were talking about it uh, recently, uh, that maybe there's a tipping point where a, long, a lengthy warranty is enough and any more is overkill. You know, people don't necessarily see themselves owning a car for 10 years. Notwithstanding Mal's point about improved resale, that's definitely a valid point. Yep. But the dif difference between, you know, seven being Kia and, and Sanyong seven years up to 10, is, is that a big deal? What do we think? I think it is. I think... Um, it's, it's more of a branding exercise than anything for Mitsubishi um, to replant themselves in people's minds um, and to say we have the best warranty in Australia is a really strong thing to say to a market where, uh, especially if you are Mitsubishi, you don't have many new products. Um, there's a lot of products that's been around for a while. The, you know, the ASX is the obvious example of a vehicle that's been 
very long in the tooth for a very long time. But yes. the, um, you know, you say to someone, you can buy it now, um, you get 10, 10 years of assured uh, warranty, a 10-year cap price servicing plan as well. This is, you know, this is a moment where people will go, so I'm never going to need to buy another new car again, potentially, you know, depending on your age or whatever. Um, yes. And that, that also lends to the thought that it could actually damage Mitsubishi's new car sales in the longer term because it might be too long. You know, people might yeah. not want to get rid of their cars and it could be good for their used car resale values, but yeah. the new car sales might actually drop because well, the, less the, people the, buy them. The, the embedded benefit there is that it creates throughput in the service workshop for Mitsubishi dealers because part of the deal is that if you have it serviced by an authorised dealer, you do go to 10 years, 200,000. If you don't do that, it's five years, 100,000. So yeah. what they're trying to do is get those older cars into the dealerships for service. Yeah. Yep. And I remember, I remember someone years ago saying that that was an issue for Suzuki in that people didn't buy new Suzukis because they hung onto the old ones for so long and handed them down through the families. Yeah. You know? and, and this is when Suzuki only sold small cars with low margin. I don't know if that's the case now, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. And yep. the other thing with Mitsubishi is they have a, a huge dealer network. Like, yeah. it's not, you know, Joe Blog's the new brand that's plonked in Australia with a dealer in Melbourne and a dealer in Sydney. Yeah, like you can take these things to dealers all over the place. I would, I would definitely want to visit a Joe Bloggs dealership though. <laughs> I reckon, I reckon, Tony LaHood, Joe Bloggs, a few others. Yeah. Well, just what, what would the logo for Joe Bloggs maybe? Joe Bloggs, I don't know, just a bloke looking downcast and uh, <laughs> kicking a few stones on the we ground. We need to set up a focus group, I think, James. <laughs> now let's see if also agreed with us. Last week, Birdie had called out the Ford Escape as aligning with Rupert Holmes' famous song, which of course is the Pina Colada song, but it's technically called Escape. Now, I said that Rupert Holmes was actually looked a lot like Kenny Everett, and let's see if agrees that a Kenny Everett doppelganger, no doubt about it. So <laughs> people on YouTube will be able to see um, a side-by-side -side image, and I think it proves the point comprehensively. Now, also, just to finish off, last time round, Senior Bob gave us some specific feedback about um, things related to, to stuff that Elon Musk had said. Um, but Grudlin74 said, tools in the Senate has some legs. We can talk legislation related to the car industry in the age of dystopia. Um, no. I, don't, I don't think we've heard the producer's voice before, um, which we heard last week. I thought he would have an accent. Um, oh. But, you know, he does have an accent. It's an Australian one. I <laughs> well, actually, it's funny that you'd say that. I The Australian is actually not my native accent. I have to ah. you know, cover it up to uh, protect my identity. Down, down. Where I'd back. ask him, if it wasn't for you, you know, pestering kids or whatever, far back in, out. Back in your box, Mr. Pritchard. Now, yeah. Pranav, Pranav Shroti uh, says time to add one more segment, Trump Watch. So, oh, I no. mean, that, that would be... Not just a rabbit hole, that would be a wormhole. Nope. That, that's nope. incredible. Now, nope. David, David <laughs> Birdie also um, finished us off with Craig Kelly because we were talking about um, some, some points of view from the federal parliament. He says, uh, Craig Kelly is a Collingwood 1990 premiership champion. The other Craig Kelly, Polly, is irrelevant. His, <laughs> words, not, his words, not mine. So, wow. So there you go. We started to dabble in areas we probably shouldn't. And Senior Bob, I think, is quite right. Now... Let's get on to the main topic of conversation for today, which is the much talked about. Um, we've run various stories on it's coming, it's coming, and, and this is what's going to have the Great Wall Cannon. And our very own Chesto has written a news update on this vehicle. It's a dual cab ute, um, and he contends that it could be a game changer because of what it's offering and potentially how it's going to be priced. We, we know it's not going to be called Canon in this market. Chesto tells us that it's going to be called the GWM Ute. Um, but then, M4, you have been driving a heck of a lot of Utes recently. Mm -hmm. where, where do you see this one plugging into the landscape, that very competitive field? If, if they stay true to the mentality of Great Wall Motors in Australia, this will be a budget player and it will likely... Um, be up against the, the likes of the LDV T60 uh, and obviously the Sangyong uh, Musso as well. But this, um, now, it's funny because I was looking at LDV T60 yesterday and the pricing that they're doing. 4x4 
turbo diesel automatic dual cab and 28,990 drive away if you're an ABN holder. Now that is astoundingly cheap. Um, but you know, Great Wall has been selling Utes in dual cab guys for twenty thousand dollars drive away in Australia wow. for quite a while now. Yes. And so this is, you know, this is sort of where we can expect. Obviously, this is a brand new Ute. You're going to have to absorb some of the costs of development in the margins for the, the vehicle. Um, plus, it's going to have much more tech. It's going to have new engines. It's going to have uh, a lot more stuff that people will want. Um, and I expect that you will still see it playing in that sub-30 area for the, the base grades. But as we've seen with a lot of Utes, um, they're realising – the, or the brands are realising they can charge more because people will pay it. If you've got the, the equipment and uh, the look, then people will buy the, what the, you've got. The value, the value is there. Yep. Yeah. So, mm. I, I, you know, he's saying that um, there's going to be the entry-level Canon model and then – so it's not called the oh, Canon, so but the, Canon the grades, the grades oh, so are called Canon. so there'll be a, a, a variant ah. or a trim level called Canon. So, okay. So, the, 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 yeah, the, see. the tiers of the range are Canon, Canon L – and Canon X. So that's that's an interesting strategy because obviously they've seen a lot of interest in this Great Wall Canon nameplate. Um, we've seen huge results from it from our stories that we've done on it, uh, and it makes perfect sense that you know they would try and embrace what we've already put in place for them. The other yep. options were the power or power, uh, which is uh. pow power without the you're, W. You're all right um, then. You're okay. Yeah, Oh, it sounds like you're having a stroke. Oh, yeah, it's, it's not a good. It's not a good one. Um, yeah. But yeah, so the GWM Ute in three different trim grades. I think the top spec is going to probably still tickle the sub forty k uh, price point. Well, uh, Chesto reckons that every grade will have a nine inch touchscreen, um, mm -hmm. Apple CarPlay, and Android Auto. While some will get an extendable ladder that's designed to make getting up into the tray. Uh, a breeze. I, I don't. Is that an accessory that you've come across much in recent times? It's, it's, a, it's not offered. One. It's not offered on any of the local uh, mid-size utes that we get. But you can get it in bigger vehicles in America and so on. Yeah, um, yeah the tailgate-mounted uh, ladder thing that helps you get in and out, which is a really good thing because these utes are just getting taller and taller. Um, mm. As my dad says, my dad's. Um, five foot five, um, and he's always gone for a low riding ute. But there's hardly any low riding utes left now. So he generally drops them on their guts and you know puts oh, bag, bags in them the whole bit. Yeah. He's a slam dog. Yeah, he for does sure. go low riding for sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, the, the rails, the democratization of um, the technology across model ranges is is not new. Uh, it's not necessarily. Um, special to the likes of Great Wall. I mean, you can now get an eight-inch touchscreen with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto in every Hilux from twenty-two thousand dollars up. Um, so it's more um, the unknowns around the safety credentials of this vehicle that are the real thing that um, sticks in my mind. Um, we've seen such big steps in the dual cab Ute market when it comes to safety tech in the likes of the new D Max and BT Fifty with you know front center airbag with uh, all speed AEB, pedestrian and cyclist detection, rear cross traffic, blind spot monitoring, a lane turn assist thing that'll yep. stop you from turning in front of traffic that's coming the other way. There's this this part of the market is probably the most interesting to watch in terms of safety stuff. Yep. Um, so I do hope that Great Wall comes with uh, a solid safety offering uh, yep. because commercial vehicles too often in the past uh, in the budget arena have been left to just go, oh, well, they're just, they're just vans, they're just utes, it doesn't matter. And given it's a new design, it really needs to have it. Otherwise, because some of the, the most important safety stuff isn't something you can add later. Yeah, it needs exactly. to be a That's fundamental true. element of the, the structure of the vehicle from the beginning, you know, mm -hmm. to, yep. to get I, it right. I was going to say, um, Chester is also uh, putting it out there that the engine that will be, the primary engine anyway, will be a two-litre turbo diesel, um, expected to produce 120 kilowatts 450 newton meters, eight speed auto or a six speed manual and all wheel drive. Um, it's 5.4 meters long. So it is it is a big, big truck. Yeah. Um, it'll have allegedly a thousand kg payload and be able to tow three tons. Yeah. Um, so, so it's got some pretty good on paper specs. Yeah. Um, the safety unknowns aside, that, that's some pretty hard working statistics right there. 
Yeah. Do we have yeah. a wheelbase figure? Uh, hold on. No. No. No, no, no. But, We've got <coughs> length, width, 1.9, a bit above, and yeah. just under 1.9 high. It'll so be it very is interesting a, from a towing point of view, the wheelbase. Yeah. Of course. yeah. yeah. It is a big vehicle, though. Like, yeah. 5.4 metres long means it's longer than a Hilux, longer than a BT-50, longer than a D-Max, and just a little bit shorter than a Ranger. And the range yeah. is a big boy in the segment. So, true, true. Um, yeah, it's uh, the wheelbase is crucial, obviously, and obviously the towing capacity of claimed minimum of 3,000 kilos, which is um, not benchmark, but it is decent. Not bad. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, there is, there's all sorts of arguments about whether the, um, the 3.5 tonne towing capacity in dual cab utes is actually that realistic or not. Mm. Um, so especially with drum brakes at the back in some instances. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's, I can't wait. Like, I, I love utes, and I've, I've obviously been spending lots of time in them. I'm yeah. actually um, We can't afford not to, to love utes. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually looking forward to not driving a ute for a little while, but that's a different <laughs> story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, cool. Hey, right, can okay. I just clarify? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Chesto's story suggested that this car is going to be named the Great Wall GWM Ute. Ute. Cannon, then... Yeah, whichever yeah. level. So, so Great Wall be... GWM Ute. That's 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 the ATM machine. Uh, <laughs> really phenomenon, mate. That could be another um, you know way into the dark web, Mel. I know you've already uh, dis <sighs> discovered one. I did tell uh, you that I saw it via, via a lift rather than an ATM, but it sounds close. Um, now we'll we'll leave it there, um, and we invite people's thoughts on the worth or otherwise of this newcomer yet to arrive, but before the end of the year, we should be seeing it. Um, would you? Would it be on your shopping list? Would you consider it at that more, um, you know, economical end of the ute market? Tell us what you think about yeah. uh, that. the Great Wall. Have you experienced how pretty good the LDV 260 is? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, that'd be good too. Yes, mm -hmm. now, we'll move on to our own garage. Mal, you're sitting in yours, quite obviously, and I think we'll kick it off with you because um, it's not a new vehicle or vehicles, but the Flynn fleet um, has been expanding in recent times. Fill us in. Well, uh, so as, as you said before, I've been away for 12 weeks, so I haven't really driven many new cars. Uh, but that has given me the opportunity, a minor opportunity, given I've been playing dad for most of it, to play with my own cars finally. And um, so I know that uh, I'm led to believe there's been some discussion about the yellow one behind me in previous yes. podcasts. So... Here it is. Yep. Um, but I just wanted to address, uh, was it Ian Thomas a few weeks ago who, who uh, was accusing me of parking in an EV spot? Yes, that's uh, right. I, I wasn't parking in an EV spot. That photo was actually taken 10 minutes after I bought the car in uh, <coughs> Adelaide at out the front of the Mitsubishi headquarters. This is how I spend my Saturdays. <laughs> uh, but the significance of it is that that EV charging point was uh, famously installed when, uh, it was in 2009, when they launched the IMEV. So it'd be one of the first public charge stations in Australia. Anyway, party time. Um, <laughs> so it wasn't actually parked there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so anyway, my Corolla, I've been driving it and uh, I've, I've managed to get all four of my old cars uh, registered finally during this break. So whew, big uh, yeah. load off my shoulders. And I've added another one to the fleet over my left shoulder, uh, which is a 116, uh, W116 Mercedes 280S. Uh, which I've wanted for a very long time. Just trying to keep up with James, of course. Um, and yeah, interestingly... You're, you're dreaming, you're dreaming, mate. Anyway, I'm working on it. Yeah. <laughs> and so, of course, I've got the MX-5 and the EH as well. But uh, interestingly, these two cars, this is a 1974, this is a 1973. When they were new, this was one of the cheapest cars on the market. This one was one of the most expensive. But right now, they're, they're selling for right? very is similar that numbers. Right? Isn't yeah. that interesting? Wow. Yeah, yeah. So, that's interesting. Uh, but I mean, the whole interest slash obsession um, with early uh, Japanese cars um, absolutely underpins that. It, it's yeah. so strong. Yeah, and a lot of it's led by scarcity uh, because you know when they were new, they were just just appliances. Disposable. And <laughs> people disposed of them when they yeah. finished using them. So there's a you know there's nostalgia paired with scarcity, and it's driving the prices up and. Uh, Anyway, yep. I'm very glad to have one. And uh, well, she's not the most beautiful thing on the road, condition-wise, but that that's really cathartic because... That's what you want. You don't have to worry about bird droppings and polishing it and stone chips and kids right. scratching it. And uh, it's, you know, beautifully engineered old Toyota. 
yep. really easy, you know, shift and clutch uh, actuations and bulletproof engine. And it's just a nice thing to, you know, putter about in. But um, Superb. you wouldn't want to have a crash. Now, that's a, that's a very good point. Now, look, in one of the biggest surprises of the year, uh, Matt, you've been driving a ute. Yes. And it's, uh, tell, tell us about this particular one. You know, I actually had someone ask me the other day, do you actually review anything other than utes now? Uh, <laughs> and I yeah. sort of thought, that's been a while. Um, no, yep. the, um, the uh, Mazda BT50 is what I've been driving uh, in most recent times. Um, in a few different trim levels, the GT top spec, uh, which you no doubt will have seen in our um, comparison test against the Ford Ranger Wildtrak and the Isuzu D-Max X-Terrain. It performed admirably. It's a it's a pretty competent vehicle, a little bit expensive, um, the GT spec, for, for what you get because it misses things like there's no sports bar, you don't get the tub liner, um, you don't get a tow bar like you do in some high-spec ranges. Um, so it's, you know, 60 grand and you're sort of going... That's that's a bit rich, um, but there are some really redeeming features of it. Um, I, I like what they've done with the design. I think it's a quite a um, charming looking vehicle. Maybe not um, muscular or masculine, but it is. But it's great to have a like a beautiful option in that class. Like it, not everyone's trying to build a monster truck. Yeah, you know, if if you're after something that isn't as aggressive, that you can now get something that that is just good looking in the yeah. nose at least and yeah. I'm, I'm not sure whether um the x terrain and wild track styling packages that you can get on those models would necessarily do the bt50 any favors um yeah. and i think the the fact that they've actually gone with no sports bar at the back does add to the appeal of it um it is yeah looks the one thing it's much more useful as a ute without one <laughs> yeah Looks are one thing, but you know the um, the performance is a different thing. It's a D Max underneath, um, and so it, it lives up to pretty much everything we've come to expect from the the D Max yeah. um, in that way. I, JC, I, was, I was going to say I, I hate those sports bars because they're generally full of drunk blokes just watching American football, and I find it hard. <laughs> I find like it hard to, to engage. Yeah, playing shuffleboard or something like that. So good on Mazda for getting rid of the sports bars. Yeah, yeah good on you. Um, so. Um, BT50, um, despite what some other people are saying, it does have some interior differentiators uh, compared to D-Max. And um, you, if you've watched any of the BT50 videos that I've done, you'll know that it really annoys me that they've taken away the pop-out cup holders on the edges of the dashboard um, that you get in the D-Max because the D-Max's centre cup holders are more like what you'd put a protein shake in. You know, they are... they're, they're they're large. They're, they're for a bottle, not a cup. Well, so you've, you been, get a, you've been bulking up for years. Oh, I mean, been, a, a pro, oh, yeah. oh. Look out. Put those um, away, mate. Put those so the, the new D-Max still has the outdoor cup holders on the dash. Yes, but the BT-50 doesn't because it's got a different dash design. Ooh. Now, yeah, the, the thing is, the if you get a, a normal-sized coffee, not a, a venti or whatever you get from Starbucks, if you get a normal-sized coffee, it, it doesn't gulped. fit properly in the central cup holders. That's a, like, if you've ever been for a drive early in the morning and you just, you need a coffee to get you going and you don't have anywhere to put it, that yeah. is annoying. Um, okay. But that's, a, okay. that's if, if that's my biggest criticism, the ute's pretty good, right? Pretty good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've also been in the XT grade, which uh, is the lowest of the grades that we've got currently. Only the dual cabs were available at launch, so we still got cab chassis and, and freestyle cab, um, single cab as well to, to cover off in the future. But um, XT grade, it's you know pretty nice. Uh, the fact that it comes with color coded bumpers and um, mirrors and alloys rather than steel wheels sets it apart in the market. Um, it looks more expensive than a lot of its rivals do at that level, and I mean even. Um, you know, SR models of the Hilux used to not have alloy wheels and have black bumpers. So mm. the 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 brand has gone for a more premium tilt at the market. And I think um, they will do what they expect. They expect to do about 7 or 8% of the dual cab market. Okay. Uh, and about, I think that's twelve to 1,400 units per month. Right. Um, and I think they'll do it. So a clearly defined niche. And they're, they're clear in terms of what they want to extract in terms of profitability rather than going for a big mass volume play into that market. Okay. Yeah. 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 And with, yeah. Back to the, the visual distinction, you know, the, the unique design alternative. Um, 
that done that before. And you remember back in 2011, it was um, certainly uh, a lot more polarising to look mm. at. It's certain, yeah. yeah, less yeah. polarising this time around. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Now, I'll thank you for that, Matt and Mel. I'll just finish off with the car that I've been driving this week, um, which is the Fiesta ST, current mm. Fiesta Ford, uh, Ford Fiesta ST. So $31,000, nearly $32,000 before you put it on the road. This time around, it's the 1.5 litre turbo petrol triple. Um, 147 kilowatts from that engine. Uh, 290 newton metres. This one's six-speed manual, front-wheel drive. Now, um, the, the, we, Lofty earlier on referenced the last-generation ST, and I've got to say I've always been a huge fan of that car because, for mine, it's a, it, it's the very sensible and fun car choice. You can have uh, heaps of fun in that car at legal speeds in town, wherever. It, it is just a beautiful, beautiful car. This one, similarly... Quick and agile in the plus column. I've got quick and agile. The gear shift and clutch are just so much fun to use. It's it's superb in that regard. Nimble steering. The Recaro seats are, are great. There's quite a lot of safety packed in the car. And the sync connectivity worked beautifully. The whole thing was very easy to use. Then on the on the not minuses, I found the brakes a bit stabby. You know, they, they weren't quite as progressive as you'd like them to be. You had to really grease them on to get a smooth application. Particularly you, around town. Beg your pardon? Particularly around town. Around town. That's, yeah. that's right, yes. And when you do um, indulge yourself and use a few more revs, there is a fair bit of torque steer there. The car does mm -hmm. want to kind of wander its way up the road, which I didn't expect. Um, the ride is a bit jittery, and that's the price you pay. If, if you're buying into this proposition, that's what you're going to get, but it's there nonetheless. And it has a monumental turning circle. It is. Mm. It, it's obviously got to do with the geometry or the gearing of the steering to make it respond so nicely. But mm. you've really got to plan your U-turns because uh, it turns like a limo. Uh, For a tiny car. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, but have a that, decent wheelbase these days. But, mm. yeah. but um, all that said, uh, I love it. I, I yeah. do love it. I think it's a worthy successor to to what was such a great ST. Um, it's, it's a terrific package. Yeah, yeah. Um, and our uh, five-door as well. So it's got the practicality element covered as yeah. well. Um, yeah. The, the thing I, because I've driven Focus ST, Fiesta ST, when I drove the Focus ST, I just kept thinking, there's no way I would buy this over the, the Fiesta, Fiesta ST. Yeah, yeah, so good, good if point. you're in that market, be sure to test drive both, but you'll make yeah. sure you're mind up. James, did you find the steering wheel surprisingly large? Yeah. No, no, actually, while I was driving it, I thought it was lovely. <laughs> okay. um, so I, I didn't have that thought. Um, but probably next time I get into it, I'll think, God, this is a big steering wheel. But no, and I didn't put a bus steering wheel. Yeah, I have one right. other, one and other. In case finding. the power steering goes out and you've yeah. got some leverage, right? That's that's <laughs> the safety logic. feature. Yeah. Wow. I had one other thought on that car was that um, there's no current gear position indicator. So what I mean by that is there's on the screen it shows you when it's like you need to shift up or you need to shift down or whatever, yep. um, but it doesn't stay on the screen. And that's yep. really annoying at times because you're like, I need to know what gear I'm in so yeah. I can attack this next corner. That's a very yeah. good point. It does prompt you on, on which gear it thinks you should be going for more, more often than not about economy. Yeah, uh, but yeah you're, you're right. There's no... Blasting around with your sub for going, Matt, and you can't hear the engine. Exactly. Yeah, as, as you tend to do. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, blasting around, not hearing what you're doing. <laughs> it's time for Musk Watch. <laughs> yeah. The first, the first piece of uh, Elon Musk news is that according to a Reddit uh, poster, you software saw... Um, Starlink Australia is about to come out of stealth mode um, because it's got a carrier licence. So all of those little satellites up there are potentially going to be accessible to Australian consumers sooner rather than later. So a week ago, SpaceX uh, changed the name of its Australian subsidiary from Tibro Australia, which is orbit backwards. Get it? What a great joke. Tibro Australia to Starlink Australia Proprietary Limited. And um, so this is a, a series of events that has played out in other markets in Canada and elsewhere. Tibro has changed to Starlink and they've started to get um, seriously into the market. So we've had, for people watching and listening from other parts of the world, Australia has had a fairly turgid uh, kind of online life where the federal government has had a thing called the National Broadband Network, 
which was a political football for a long time and has proved somewhat problematic in application. So various people looking at this story were saying, well, it could just be a way around the NBN, that you've got these satellites up in the sky and all of a sudden subscribing to that is going to be a very attractive option. And so is 5G, though. So uh, yeah. don't, don't get my neighbour started on 5G. She's one of the believers. Oh, God. All right. OK, <laughs> well, let's, let's move on. Let's leave that. So <laughs> the, the other news, according to Variety, and we don't often uh, quote that entertainment title, but HBO is developing a limited series about SpaceX, um, the space exploration company founded by Elon Musk. Now, this is to quote Variety, the six-episode series, SpaceX, will be based on the book Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and the Quest for a Fantastic Future by Ashley Vance. So I wasn't aware of that book, but people on YouTube will be able to see a picture of its cover as we speak. Now, this is where we were talking earlier. Is it a documentary? Is it drama? What is it? This may tell part of the story. It will document how Musk, in pursuit of his lifelong dream to make humankind a multi-planetary species, handpicks a team of engineers to work on a remote Pacific island where they build and launch the first SpaceX rocket into orbit. So I think the Pacific island thing, I'm not sure that's real. Mm. That, that may be a, a fictionization or a dramatization. Anyway, yeah. you've got that to look forward to, and it's going to be produced by Channing uh, Tatum. Uh, produced well, or starred? Produced. Now, look, really? he, might, he might end up, you know, putting himself into the action there, but I've got no idea. And, like and of Elon. it's worth pointing oh, out God. that yeah. Musk is not attached to the show in any way. He's, it's right. not his initiative. Because on the um, surface, it sounds to me like, and I've likened uh, Musk to Howard Hughes many times before, but it sounds like he's reading, you know, the latest chapter of How to Be Howard Hughes. Maybe. Uh, given he went all Hollywood on us. Oh, uh, imagine, imagine but, if... They, um, Channing Tatum was playing Elon Musk. Mark. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think the slow, the slow disrobing as he kind of blasts off from this yeah. app. Because be Brad Pitt wasn't available, you know. I would, I would have thought Tom Cruise would be a better fit. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe they could each play him at different stages of his life. <laughs> um, now, the, the, um, the, the last thing in Musk Watch, uh, look, it's a really great meme starter. It was like a catalyst for a meme that uh, Elon just put out there on the Twitters. And he said, okay, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me, Winston Churchill. So he was, he was <laughs> alleging that Winston Churchill had made that quote. Which of course <laughs> is that brilliant Hathaway clip from too long ago that, yeah. um, that you can't get out of your head once you hear it. It sticks with you Thanks. for a couple of weeks. Yep. So then Chad Abram Hun came back with his own and said, America is all about speed. Hot, nasty, badass speed. <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> <laughs> and then Corey said, she got a big booty, so I call her Ms. Big Booty, Socrates. <laughs> or, or, as Bill and Ted would say, so great. Um, now, <laughs> then you've got... to say that again, aren't they? They are. Yeah. But then another user called Chat But Not says, racism, bad. Albert Einstein, after writing the Bible. And then <laughs> Alexander says Tesla will dominate the automotive industry, Aristotle. And Saba Trivedi says, wow, Mahatma Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> and Glitch 3D says the proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains, Kim Kardashian. <laughs> and and in, in all of these, there was one genuine Winston Churchill quote, which I thought was amazing. And a lot of listeners and viewers will probably know it, but I wasn't familiar with it. It's from Mushahid Hussain. It says, if you're going through hell, keep going. Yeah. And uh, what, a, what a fantastic uh, quote that is. So then we move to the Tesla share price. Now, it's $446.65. It was $425.92 last week. So it's not really going uh, anywhere. It's vacillating in this band between about $415 and $450. It's been that way for the last couple of weeks. And the Motley Fool says, forget Tesla. There's another EV maker called New Technologies uh, that has far greater growth potential. Now, Motley Fool says, with Tesla already at a market value of $400 billion, there are likely better places for investors if they're looking for big gains. You know, where, where's the big leap going to come from? This company is Chinese, founded in 2014, seven products and growing, and they're scooters. 
So they're electric scooters and small motorcycles. They've got really, they've got mega sales in China, solid profits. They're currently worth about two billion and Motley Fool theorizes that the stock could rapidly double or triple from here in the short term. So put it this way, uh, a share was $7 in April and it's currently $27.37. So they're saying if you want an EV uh, techie style stock, that's the one to go for. It's on the NASDAQ and it's NASDAQ NIU. So there you go, there's our you know, tip, tip for you. And with that, we have reached the finish line. And I wanna say thank you, Matt. Thank you. And thank you, Mal. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks to our digital distribution optimizer, director of life enrichment and bacon critic in residence, Mr. Pritchard for his unwavering skill with headphones on and mouse in hand. Today, he's wearing a shirt saying, I wasn't listening, so I'm going to smile, nod, and hope for the best. <laughs> Rainbow sequin disco pants and cobra boots. Now, if you can see those on YouTube, you will not believe your eyes. <laughs> Please pass on the word about the podcast and let us know your thoughts by searching for Cars Guide on Facebook and Instagram using the hashtag CG Podcast or email us at comments at carsguide.com.au. If you're an Apple Podcast listener, please rate and review us. And remember, you can watch us on YouTube. But before we go, reports this week of a series of break-ins focused on motor trimmers in the inner western suburbs. According to police, based on the locations and some of the exotic fabrics stolen, this criminal is clearly following a pattern. Oh. <laughs> That's a stitch up. <laughs> <laughs> Cut right there. <laughs>